So last week, Liz and I got to mark off three years of being married together. And y'all, it was an awesome day. It was right on Thanksgiving. We were uh, having a smaller Thanksgiving due to COVID and everything, but it, it, it was great. I mean, Liz made her own mashed potatoes. We threw in some garlic in there. If you saw Chapel, you know that's a big favorite of mine. Uh, we threw some bacon in there just for fun, just to try it out. Uh, we got one of those smoked turkeys. We got an awesome family that just every year blesses us with a super cool uh, smoked turkey out of Sam's Club. Uh, we we had uh, uh, pumpkin pie, which is one of my favorite. I mean, it was just, it, it was great. And on top of that, we got to hang up some Christmas lights, which is one of my favorite things. And the fact that on the outside of our house, it actually worked this year. So pff, awesome there. Uh, the, you know, Charlie was great. Captain was great. Dinner was great. Everything was great. It was a great way to just celebrate Thanksgiving with a great family. You know, to, to be able to have a, a great day celebrating our anniversary and a great day to just thank God that he gave it all to us. But then Friday came, and, and Friday was kind of a mess, all right? It, uh, not a lot of people love this word. Friday kind of sucked, all right? And the reason it did is we just, everything that could go wrong seemed to go wrong that day. All right, first, we were dealing kind of all week, but Friday we were continuing to wait on it. Uh, we were dealing with a bit of a uh, coronavirus scare. So dealing with that. Then we find out that Liz's great aunt passed away. Then uh, if you follow me on Facebook, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you may have already seen this. Uh, while trying to get some Christmas boxes down out of our attic, uh, I stepped through the ceiling, got a big hole covered up over there in the next room. Um, it is not, not a great moment, all right? The stress was real. And then on top of that, we think the rest of the weekend, it can't possibly get worse. You know, we're kind of just riding out the negativity that had been going on on Friday. Monday morning at 1.30 a.m., this is Liz's first day back at school after this week-long break, okay? You think it's a nice day. It's kind of stressful. But Charlie decided at 1.30 a.m. to wake up and be ready for the day. It was a long, long morning. It was so, so frustrating. All we wanted was some peace. And do y'all ever feel like that? Do y'all ever feel like this world isn't, isn't letting you experience the peace that it seems we hear about all the time in Scripture? You know, the peace that passes all human understanding. The peace that Jesus was supposed to bring when he came as a little sweet baby, which we're getting ready for, which we're talking about. I mean, it's not just my house where it seems like the peace is maybe a little bit scarce. All right? You look at the world around us. There's no peace. There's no peace in the Middle East. There's no peace between the, the right wings and the left wings. There's no peace anywhere, it would seem. It's just chaotic moment after chaotic moment blowing up all around us. It's scary. Where is the peace at? And that, y'all, that is the question of today. Where's the peace? Because if you keep up with your Advent wreath traditions, you will know that this, being week two, it's all about peace. You know, week one is all about hope. Week two is all about peace. Week three, we'll talk about next week. Week four, week after that. And then Jesus is here. Woo! It's awesome. But this week, it's all about peace. The peace that, that was supposed to have entered our world when the Prince of Peace was born. And it all comes down to this prophecy given to us in Isaiah chapter 9. Take a look. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So as I read that to you, what did you hear? Let me tell you what I heard, right? I hear that when Jesus comes, government is done, all right? Because Jesus is going to do all the ruling. Jesus is going to reign over everything. Last week, we talked about how when Jesus comes, he's going to settle all international disputes. He's taking it all on. Everything's going to be great, all right? I don't care if you love Trump or if you love Biden. I don't care if you love any of the world leaders. They cannot do what Jesus is coming to do. Jesus is going to bring real peace. How cool is that? So what I hear is when Jesus comes, peace is coming, all right? When the Prince of Peace comes, there will not only be peace in the world, it will be unending. In fact, what we heard in verse seven is it will continue to increase and continue to grow and continue to get better and better and better. What I hear is that when the King comes, he's bringing peace unlike anything we have ever 
seen. So where's it at? You see, how, how I just tried to bias you in reading that prophecy is the same way that, that many Israelites read it. And so when Jesus came, they were expecting exactly what I just asked you, this perfect peace, this, this ascension for Israel, for Jerusalem, to ascend to the highest point, to be the political center, the political top of the world. But that's not what Jesus came to do. And yet, it's frustrating there because it says, you know, he's bringing peace. You know, the, the Prince of Peace is coming. The increase of his peace and his government will, will have no end. He will continue to be in our world forever and ever. So why isn't there peace right here? Jesus came, right? Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus ascended. Everything was great. Where's the peace? Well, if y'all were with us last week, we talked a little bit about how Isaiah's prophecies are really kind of twofold. There's two layers, there's two events that Isaiah is prophesying about. One of them is when the sweet little baby is coming, and one is after Jesus ascends, when he comes back. But having never had a Savior ascend before, having never had to look forward to a second coming, no one was looking for that. Everyone was thinking, when Jesus comes, we're good. All right, that's why you had all these religious factions that were, Jesus, when are you going to take over Rome? Jesus, when are you going to destroy Syria? Jesus, when are you going to do all this awesome stuff in order to set us free and raise us up to the highest point we thought we were supposed to be at? What they missed is Jesus came to bring us a certain kind of peace. And later when he returns, will give us the full scope of that peace. So let's look at what those first two things are. The first kind of peace that Jesus brings is a peace between God and us. And if you've been in confirmation before, if you've had any sort of faith one-on-one classes, sometimes we'll talk about this, sometimes we won't. There's a vertical relationship and there's a horizontal relationship that exists in our world. And the vertical relationship is between God and man. And the horizontal is just between men, all right? All of us are in this horizontal area where we're trying to get along. You know, we're trying to live our lives together. We're trying to, to operate in this way. And the peace that Jesus brought in his first coming was only a peace between God and man. The peace that will expand to the rest of the world, that's not coming until Jesus comes back. And that's, that's a struggle for us because, one, we can't understand it. All right, it's a peace that passes all human understanding. We hear that in scripture a couple times. And it's a peace that will fill the entire earth. It's something we've never seen before. And what that means is there's no more war. There's no more death. There's no more sin. There's just peace. But we have to wait. We have to wait for that full scope of peace to enter our world. But while we wait, we do get that glimpse of what that peace will look like in understanding that there's now peace in the relationship between God our Father and us. Because before Jesus, all we had to look forward to was the wages of sin being death. And what that means is, if you sin, you're going to hell. All right? Period. Flat out. You have to earn your way to heaven. But when Jesus came, he earned it. He paid the price for all of us. We are all going to heaven because of our faith in him, because of the work that he did. All you can do now is tell him, I don't want that grace. I don't want that gift. I don't want to do that. Otherwise, it's ours. And so the fact that so many people reject it is, is so crazy to me. But let's not tell, deal with that quite yet. First, let's look at the peace that we have with God our Father. A peace that now shifts us away from being these these outcasts, these failures, these, these pure sinners destined for hell. And now we are marked as one of God's children. It's a peace that we receive in knowing that because of Christ's death and resurrection, we will be with him for all eternity. It's a peace that comes along with our baptism when we are truly marked, you know, with that cross on our foreheads and and on our hearts where, where God says, that is my son or that is my daughter. That's the peace we receive. It's the peace we receive. It accompanies our soul when we come to the table of the Lord, when we receive his body and blood and are assured once again of the forgiveness that we receive, the fact that our slate is wiped clean, that we are being filled with his grace. 
and are assured of our salvation purely by the grace earned by Christ's work on the cross. It's a subjective peace. It's an internal peace. Sometimes it bleeds out into the world, and that's so cool to see. But what we are assured of is that the relationship between God and us, there's peace there. All right? Jesus has created that peace. Jesus has closed that chasm. But the horizontal peace isn't quite here yet. And Jesus tried to make that clear. Jesus tried to explain what Isaiah was trying to say in our text for today. He was trying to help people see, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. Take a look, 10 verse 34. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace on the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus flat out says, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. All right, that's, that's a little confusing. All right? His mission, vision, and values were not meant to bring peace to all of humanity. That's not the goal yet. The goal was to bring peace between God and man. Was to, to bridge that relationship. I talked about that huge chasm that was in there. If you look at some of the parables that are in there, especially the one with uh, uh, Lazarus and the rich man. When, when the rich man dies and goes to hell, it's described as this gigantic chasm between hell and God. And what Jesus did is Jesus has closed that for us who believe, for us who have received that grace, for us who have been called into his, his amazing light and continue to live faithfully for him. The grace of Jesus received through faith, that's what assures us of this. That's what's closed the chasm. No longer is sin, death, and the power of the devil separating us from God. No, God is here with us. God is in us. God is living amongst us. There's peace between us and our Creator. Jesus came to bring peace so that we would know the love of our Father in heaven. But He didn't come to bring peace on earth. He didn't come so that all of us would just get along here now. Because He actually came to stir things up. That's what He means when He says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to be divisive. I've come to cause division because I've come in order to show you that how the world operates doesn't line up with how God has called you to live. Because when we as humanity are left to our own devices, y'all, we're a mess. All right? When, when we look at what we do and think this is the right way to go, it's a problem. Because when we are given a box to play in, all we're doing is immediately looking just over the edge of the box and to see, okay, I, I want that. You know, this is where you've called me to live, but I want to go do this over here. I mean, look at our world. Look at how it's fallen. Look at what it's turned into. Just to name a couple, I mean, we got transgenderism, homosexuality, adultery, pornography, infidelity, abortion, cohabitation, premarital sex, fornication, pedophilia, bestiality. All of these things are becoming more and more acceptable by the day. And it is insane to me that we continue to just think, oh, this is fine. Because where in Scripture does it say, oh, wait, everyone's okay with that? Oh, well, dang, okay, that's on us. You know, we're out, we're out of the times. So go ahead. If everyone's good with it, you should be good with it too. Never once does Scripture say that. Scripture actually doubles down. In the Old Testament, it had a pretty clear stance on homosexuality. Paul took the same position. We are called to speak truth into people's lives, to potentially cause division, because Jesus didn't come to bring peace on earth yet. But still hearing that, that kind of flies in the face of our paradigm, right? It kind of flies in the face of, of how people, whether Christian or not, view the church. Because what are we supposed to do as the church? We're supposed to be peacemakers, right? And what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Well, in, in culture, that, that means you have to be nice. The socially acceptable, politically correct, culturally appropriate response to all things is to be nice. You know, you gotta make compromises because you have no right to judge that person. You know, you, you have to be passive because no one wants to be held accountable. You, you have to just accept people for the lifestyles that they've chosen to have. You know, you have to please everyone and avoid conflict at all costs, all right? Conflict is sin. And we're told that, that tolerance is, is a hallmark of peace. That passivity is necessary to keep the peace. It maybe even is, is labeled as being patient. 
But y'all, it's cowardice. It's a fear to lose what we have. Look back at verses 35 and 36. This is what Jesus came to do. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. This is not a very peacemaker vision Jesus is laying out for us. I mean, what does it mean that he's coming to turn a family in on itself? To create division, to, to harm relationships. I mean, what does it mean that the enemies are going to be within our own homes? Especially in light of what Jesus says just a chapter later. Chapter 11, verse 29. Take a look. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. All right, Jesus, this is getting a little confusing because you just said I came to bring the sword, but now you're saying be gentle and humble. How, how are you being gentle and humble if you came to break up families? But that's where our passage today for us becomes a bit of a litmus test. It causes us discomfort because we too are a part of the world that has been swayed by Satan's twisting of what it means to be nice, of what it means to be a peacemaker, of what it means to speak the truth in love. We've confused our terms. We've taken what's true from what Christ has said and instead have, have taken what's true in light of what culture has decided is best. I mean, we so often equate Jesus' mission of, of bringing the love of God to all mankind as Jesus being a nice guy. But Jesus wasn't always a nice guy. I mean, if you, if you look at scripture, that's not true. I mean, people like to think, well, Jesus was never short with people. You know, Jesus never got angry. Jesus accepted everyone for the lifestyles that they were living. Jesus avoided conflict at all costs. Y'all, that is such a load of garbage. All right. If you truly believe that Jesus avoided conflict at all costs, please let me know. All right. Comment in this video. Send a message. Email it to me. All right. Pastor Kevin at BSLC.com. All right, text me, call me, let me know that you believe that Jesus never engaged in conflict and we will happily walk through the gospels with you and I'll point out every instance where he does. All right, Jesus is so often engaging in conflict because the truth that God has given to us, y'all, it is divisive, it is a sword, it cuts through the bowl in our world. And sometimes it destroys relationships. Jesus engaged in conflict, whether people were ready to hear it or not, because for Jesus, he knew your destiny is hell unless you hear the truth of who I am and the love my Father has for you. And until we walk through the Gospels together, let me give you an example of Jesus jumping into conflict to wet your whistle. Because in that exact same chapter where Jesus just said, you know, I'm, I'm gentle and humble, just nine verses earlier, 11 verse 20, he says, or he does, then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. Y'all, are, are you hearing what I just said? That, that doesn't sound like peacemaker in light of cultural, being culturally appropriate, politically correct, or socially relevant, socially tolerant, whatever you want to call it, whatever sort of phrase you want to use in order for, for people to say, I can live my life how I want to live it. All right. Jesus is flat out saying, nope, I don't know those people. And think about what this verse is saying here. All right. These weren't people who heard about Jesus. These were people who firsthand saw his power. They saw his majesty. They saw him heal people just exercise demons, turn a tiny little lunch into enough to feed 5,000 people. This is insane that people are like, nah, he's not real. All right, that was all just tricks. None of it's real. Are you kidding? You got to see Jesus. And Jesus denounced them. Jesus spoke some of the scariest words in, in all of our lives. I don't know them. It's, it's a hard Thing to hear, but the truth is, Jesus wasn't nice how the world defines being nice. Jesus wasn't a peacemaker how our culture defines being a peacemaker. Jesus was true. 
I was listening to a podcast getting ready for today, and I just, I, I love how they described it. How they described Jesus being nice is, is in the sense that he was good, righteous, and holy. He was kind and gracious. And he was also shrewd, discerning, and 100% committed to the truth. Jesus spoke the truth into people's lives and was divisive when necessary. He challenged the way things were. He challenged the traditions that that man came up with, that the church came up with, that the, the Pharisees, the leaders in the temple came up with. Because everything we do is tainted by sin. And if we just continue to follow our own traditions, how we've always done things, how we've liked to do things, we will end up in the same place that sinners do, being broken, being separated from God. We have to put our focus back on the truth of who Jesus is and what he's called us to do. And what he's called us to do? To speak the truth in people's lives to live according to the scriptures, to stay true to the peace that is inside each and every one of us and look forward to the day when it will be inside of all people. Do you all hear what I'm saying? Because what that means is we have to be prepared for the real possibility that we will have to be divisive. We have to prepare for the very likely moments in our lives where we will have to engage in conflict. We have to be prepared for the very real instances, the very difficult situations where we will have to speak the truth in love when it's not really something that anyone wants to hear. We have to be prepared to lose our parents, our kids, our spouses, our friends, our relationships, our families, everyone for the one that we follow. If we cling to those relationships, Jesus says it over and over again in verses 37 and 38, if we cling to those relationships, you are not worthy of being mine. It sounds so harsh but it shows the seriousness of what Jesus is talking about. Being culturally nice, politically nice, socially nice, how our world defines nice, that's not what Jesus has called us to do. That's not what's gonna bring peace in our world because the only thing that's gonna bring peace in our world is Jesus. And he didn't come to do it yet. And so what we're called to do is to speak the truth and love to take on this burden of of having the truth of how we're called to live, of how we're called to be a part of this world. That's what it means to take up our cross. But it's a tension. You're living in a tension because some people will hear what I just said. We ought to speak the truth in love. And they're, they already got a list on their phone or a list in their hand or a list on a piece of paper. It's like, these are the 10 people who I know are sinners. All right. These are the 10 people who need to hear the truth that Pastor Kevin just told me to share with them. All right. And understand there's still sin when we bring the truth. We are simultaneously saints and sinners. You know, we may be trying to do what's best, but at the same time, sin is coming in. And so it's a tension that we live in because just because we know the truth doesn't mean we suddenly stop sinning, okay? There will be moments where we really drop the ball, where we should have spoken the truth in love, okay? In love, remember, the truth in love, it may be divisive, but it's always given in love, where we may have the opportunity to share that truth and for whatever reason, we choose not to. Okay, I say whatever reason, but really there's one that we like to say. I've said it myself. I'm sure you have. The reason we give ourselves, the lie we tell ourselves for not speaking the truth is, well, it was was for the sake of the relationship. Y'all, we're called to speak the truth in love. We're called to speak the law into people's lives when necessary. But then at the same time, there will be moments where we feel like, well, I have to speak the truth. I have to speak the law. I have to let them know that they're living in a broken life. We think it's for their benefit, but in reality, it's, it's just to serve our own selfish purposes. And you may hear that and think, Kevin, what am I supposed to do then? Okay, you told me to speak the truth and now you're telling me not to. What am I supposed to do? You got to immerse yourself in the peace that we've been given. 
You got to immerse yourself in scripture. You got to immerse yourself in prayer. You got to immerse yourself in meditation and focusing on what does God want me to do? Because sin is still present in all of our world. But the personal peace that we have with our God, that vertical peace that we have received through the work that Christ has done, it's going to continue to move us forward. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of each of us, that Holy Spirit who sanctifies us on a daily basis, will continue to train our hearts and minds as we continue to dive into what it's leading us to. Diving into scripture, diving into devotions, diving in to just the history of what our world is all about and how Christ fits into it. The Holy Spirit will give us the words to say in the moments when they need to be spoken of speaking the truth in love. Whether it's to maintain the relationship or possibly to sever it. And our Heavenly Father will continue to place people in our lives, will continue to put opportunities in our lives to share that love. And even if we blow it, you know, even if we choose, oh, I'm not going to speak love today, when in reality we should have, or we choose to speak truth when maybe we shouldn't have. It's hard, but no matter what we do, God is there with us. God is there to pick us up, to dust us off, to let us know, you know what, you messed up today. Let's jump back in it tomorrow. Because that's what it means to have peace with our God. He's not going to write you off because you messed up once. He's not going to abandon you because you failed to speak the truth in love. He's going to continue to equip you with exactly what you need and give you opportunity after opportunity. And it doesn't stop when you hit 65. There's no retirement from, from this awesome gift that we have to speak truth in people's lives. Until the day you die, God's giving you opportunities to speak truth in love. Till the day Jesus brings peace to all the world. That is our burden. That's the cross that we take up. That's our calling to follow Christ no matter what the cost. We may lose everyone and everything. But that's where the hope returns. The peace that we have with our Father in heaven, it's made known in, in that loss there. Because in that last part of verse 39, okay, take a look at the whole thing right here. If you cling to your life, you will lose it, right? Again, clinging to this world, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. What Jesus is saying there is if you lose everything because you followed me, your reward will be just as great. Your reward will be better than you can possibly imagine. It'll be unimaginable to you in this moment. It will be immeasurably more than you could possibly conceive of. But understand, if you cling to the things of this world, the risk we're running is Jesus saying, you're not worthy of being mine. But as we continue to sacrifice relationships, you know, opportunities to, to rise up in this world, as we continue to lose things in this life, know that Christ is preparing for you to have everything and more. We just have to wait. And through it all, we're not alone. I've said it before. It's one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. I'll say it again, and I'm going to say it right now. Matthew 28, verse 20. In all that we are doing, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As we live our lives in truth and love, speaking truth in love, as we live in tension, speaking divisive truth when necessary, as we live in a world of chaotic disorder, know that the peace you have with your Father in heaven will one day be known throughout the earth. The day when Christ returns. And so for now, we wait on that day. We wait on that future promise. We wait on peace. Amen.